And again, I, I always argue to my Democrat friends, <laughs> I'm among them, we should be arguing along with both parties on tax reform that works for businesses um, in a climate like this. Let me just make one more comment. An another, um, I think, positive change that I've seen in our community, and this is, is not as recent as some of the other things we've talked about, but I think um, Cleveland Bridge Builders and the Cleveland Leadership Institute, um, I, I think the, the founders of Cleveland Bridge Builders did a phenomenal job of saying, we don't want to wait our turn anymore. We really, we want to have an organization where younger, a younger generation and younger leaders and future leaders can really come together and we can push them to get engaged in the community and engaged in our, our civic um, organizations and not just kind of waiting and saying, well, you know, nobody's letting us get engaged and so we're not gonna do anything until, you know, we're old enough or senior enough to get involved in Leadership Cleveland. But I think they've done a phenomenal job. It's probably, is it eight years now, seven years? And if you think of all of the people right. that have gone through that leadership, through Bridge, Cleveland Bridge Builders program, um, and, and being really pushed to get involved in the civic issues that they care about and getting them exposed to those issues, um, I think it's, it's phenomenal. And I, I can't say enough good things about the Cleveland Leadership Institute. I think they're doing a great job. Uh, Ken, and I'm going to start for you, Chris. So why don't you discuss some collaboration, some collaborative efforts or coalitions you've initiated that might be replicated by some uh, current leaders in the community? Sure. I, the um, issue, I think, of this sort of regional co-op um, manifests itself in opportunities all over the city. Um, in the circle, we have started a, um, a co-op among the 40 institutions that represent us to literally create buying co-ops and, uh, and buy into the supply chains, chains of the Cleveland Clinic and University Hospitals and Case Westerns with the small and mid-sized um, institutions now doing that. That's been uh, a successful strategy. We're actually working with Randy in a consultant capacity on something similar with that with our private merchants. They want to get into um, the supply chains uh, as a supplier to the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, the foundations have been helpful in that regard um, in this greater university circle area. Look, if you look at the uh, play dealer reporting of the companies that were in the top 10 in 1960, and you look at, as uh, Sharon Broussard's piece came out a few years ago, showing today's um, top 10 firms, they're completely different. There's only one firm in 1960 that was a top 10 employer in Cleveland, um, and on the same list uh, post-2000, that was Ford, and that's probably changing as we go. <laughs> but you know the largest employers. They are the clinic and they are UH, number one and two in the city of Cleveland, number two and four in the state of Ohio. But the key is getting smaller um, businesses into that supply chain. The key also, uh, from a workforce development standpoint, is again, to organize around that asset that we are the headquarter medical city, if we think of ourselves as such, in this country, and, and potentially one of the world's greatest cities for that matter. But how do you get everybody rallied around that platform? Uh, we're starting to do it with our co-op outreaches um, in the neighborhoods around us. Yeah, I'll take, I'll take a uh, different example since Chris took my medical Sorry example from me. <laughs> too close to it. It's my stump speech. Uh, <laughs> later. The, um, the, you know, the example I'll use, I'll use another grassroots type of uh, organization that I was involved in, in starting and growing, and that's an internship program that we run in the summer that brings students from eight different universities and Case Western Reserve here to Cleveland to immerse them in our city, introduce them to the professional and personal opportunities, and then eventually use that as a, a way to start the conversation about moving them back here permanently. And what I've found in starting that organization is there is a lot of energy uh, that's out there among Clevelanders. I mean, Clevelanders in general are a, a disaffected group, uh, and they tend to be down on it until you start engaging with them. And there is this pride of place that's still resident throughout our community and those individuals wanted to come together to recruit new uh, folks back to Cleveland to help uh, with the economic revitalization. And we've been able to grow that, adding almost a new alumni club every year. This year we just added the University of Chicago to the program. And in that program, uh, we've, I see an alum up here on the panel. Uh, we, uh, we've now brought 55 kids back to Cleveland permanently, most of whom have never been to Cleveland. Just I'd like you to describe some new techniques that some other emerging or established leaders can use to create change and perhaps contrast those with uh, some techniques that might have been used by some more traditional uh, uh, leadership strategies in the past. You want to start off with Sure. Um, I, I think it goes back to your last uh, question on collaboration. I, I think the collaboration point is very, very important so that we don't have, you know, 
lots of different organizations out there working on the same issues but not sharing their resources and wasting, mo wasting money. And so I, I think when we see organizations that are working towards the same goals, we need to try to encourage them um, to collaborate. And this is just a small example, but um, we have a women's initiative at our firm. It's something that we feel very strongly about. We want to make sure that um, we are promoting women and giving, giving women in our firm, but also in the broader community, an opportunity to dialogue with each other, to talk about leadership, to talk about um, you know, women rainmaking and moving up the corporate ladder. And so instead of us just doing that ourselves internally and inviting you know, our own guests and our own clients, we look at all the other organizations or try to in the community that are working on the same issue. Like the YWCA, for example, is doing a lot on um, promoting women, looking at diversity issues. And so we've collaborated with them. Key Bank has a key for women. We've collaborated with Key and just looking at what are the best programming options out there and not trying to recreate everything ourselves. So I think the collaboration point is, is very important. And I want to pick up on something Chris said earlier about the new model for development. You're going neighborhood, region, global. And one of the, I guess, things for, for new leaders to think about is how do you take whatever idea you've got nurturing here in the Cleveland area and immediately connect it to global resources, whether it's the national network that April described. You know, we've seen examples of individual international communities trying to reach out and find ways to bring businesses or do import-export trade with home countries uh, outside of the United right. States. And, that's, that's a model for developing that's very different than what we've done here traditionally in Cleveland, where you kind of move from one locality to one county to two counties and, and beyond. Exactly. Right. I would just add, um, with respect to Policy Bridge, the think tank that you referenced in uh, my introduction, um, I, our executive director is here, Mark Batson. Uh, Mark and I uh, co-founded Policy Bridge a few years ago, and we are uh, getting back to the issue of education. I uh, read a re research report called The Rap on Culture where we talked about how uh, kids are bombarded in urban communities with negative messages. And we decided to um, write a report about it and kind of highlight it. And people said to us, well, why don't you figure out a way to counter that with positive messages? Well, nothing like that had ever been uh, tried um, in the Cleveland area. And we have a campaign going. I, I have a pen on that you probably can't see that says Education Pays. Uh, the campaign is called Education Pays, Get Yours. And we're running a nine-month campaign where we pick three Cleveland neighborhoods to bombard with positive messages about education. And uh, we have this uh, being professionally evaluated. And uh, what has been different is that we've taken traditional marketing practices. So we have three PR firms working with us to do billboards, bus signs, mailings, et cetera. But then we're also mobilizing grassroots organizations on the ground so that kids not only have to rely on the schools, but they can also go to neighborhood centers, after school programs, and continue their education. And we think that um, this will, could potentially change the way we view and, and promote the value of education, not only in Northeast Ohio, but throughout the country and perhaps the world. We um, have traveled to other cities that have just uh, gotten very excited about this. Mark was in New Orleans. Uh, people were, bring it here, we love it. Uh, I was in Michigan. Uh, I had a person from Detroit and a person from Chicago trying to yank the papers out of my hand because they were so, so excited about it. Um, so I think that, you know, it gets back to what April talked about, collaboration, trying things that we haven't tried before. Um, it's okay if you fail. You have to at least try to do things differently because that's the only way we'll get to where we need to go. I, I think we have an enormous opportunity uh, of scale with respect to the population size of our city now. Um, we, we have, I think, the opportunity to be the greatest mid mid-sized city uh, in this country um, for a variety of reasons. Um, we have the old big city assets when our city was a top 10 uh, population city. But what you get in that mid-sized city is what I think a lot of you, maybe all of you know, which is one of the incredible social networks in this town where people really do know people, um, where you know people are two degrees of separation from each other in this town. And it's manifested itself very well in the social networking that goes on. It's been led by a group younger than me. I'm 40 years old. I wish when I was 25 there was the professional network that exists now. Uh, you were ask, asking earlier about sort of, you know, look at, looking to places of aspiration and hope. The 2030 Club has more than 500 members that meet on a regular basis. I call them uh, solution salons, they, not the barbershop, which by the way, that's always a good place to get some solutions. But, but these so solution salons, that people come together in these after work meetings in this town now, and they are searching for solutions. They're talking ideas, they're talking solutions. And what they're doing is they're actually bringing another generation above them into the fold. Um, a kid with Al Ratner, as an example, uh, 
uh, April brought up Forest City. He stays young because he stays with young people. 